Well, let's see. Okay, I think it is not a loose connection. I think it is a hum, but from the thing, I might have a loose a color change. So I leave, and now it changed again. I can so I can control the sound from the speakers with the. Okay, so bonus bonus commentary about technology and sound for people who showed up early. Uh, there is obviously parallels between the issues of electricity and sound and all of these things. And so the way speakers work, of course, you have a magnet connected to the electrical inputs that, mag that basically electrify this metal chassis around the magnet and the magnet's connected to paper and then the, the magnet vibrates then you get the paper or whatever and then so electricity going through the system is creating some sort of electrical field around that magnet and there we go we have a buzz so I tried to at various times figure out how to deal with this buzz issue and you can get little buzz canceller types of things that try to do that they don't always work because it depends on what the solution is in my home teaching studio, it turns out that what I did was, at one point, figure out that if in fact I plug in my external audio and I plug that in to my PA, but I plug the PA into a different outlet and then I plug the computer into the outlet on the opposite side of the room, then the buzz goes away. And it doesn't matter if I have the PA on, but I had to make sure that the external audio was in fact plugged into the PA because if I just tried to run the computer on its own without being plugged into the PA that was off, then I would have a buzz coming from the computer itself, which I was using, or even just the headphones and in my recordings. And so if I could plug in the PA but keep it off, then I will have no buzz. And sometimes that's the type of crazy things you have to do when you're trying to deal with audio. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, so the the issue, I think, to, to some degree varies a lot based on the um, computer you're using. So I recognize actually now, although ironically enough, um, someone is, what was going on there? That's funny. Uh, I'm going to turn off my networking because I have a conflict in some sense with my audio setup and my networking on this particular laptop. Uh, looks like I've got about three minutes, so I'm going to still wait until that. Yes? Question? Uh, so it, what happened is that my particular audio interface was a powered one, so it needed to be plugged in, and then I was still connected to the electrical system. And so when I switched to a different audio interface that was USB powered, then I was able to run without the buzz when everything was completely, you know, no connection to the power circuit. Uh, but it was like if I had the audio interface plugged in, then I originally was trying to think, well, you know, how do I just have the audio interface and the computer, and maybe I plug them both in. And it didn't actually work, however it panned out, to have the computer plugged into one thing and the audio interface plugged into the other one. That didn't even cancel the loop. It had to be that the audio output from the interface went to the PA. Or I had to have everything not plugged in and it was all just battery powered. That's an interesting, uh, interesting point, right? Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I don't. Don't think anything. I was well. The PA actually did have a ground. Um, that might have been related to it, but that actually canceled it.
Interesting. If I understand right, would I should just go ahead and get started then? Uh, Soon or? Yeah, I got a Okay. <laughs> I don't think I have any third prongs today. So, welcome everybody. Thanks for showing up. Uh, my name is Aaron Wolf. I am a music teacher. I live in Portland, Oregon, and I happen to also be involved in this crazy project called Snowdrift.coop, which has a booth here at the expo as a non-profit sort of community-run thing that we're trying to get off the ground. And so that's one of the big things that brought me here, but for some crazy reason I decided to also give this talk. And this is actually connected to what I do for a living, because I teach music lessons. And I went through a process in 2012, basically frustrated with issues that I saw in where Apple was going, and because uh, I had been a Mac user. And that relates more to my students as much as to me, and it has to do with the idea that I was really happy to find that I could find programs like MuseScore and Audacity that are under the GPL, and I was using them, and they were neat, and I could show them to my students, and this is about enabling my students to use interesting technology that they use to make music. So, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah. So, in 2012, I decided to switch to a Linux system after being frustrated with not being able to tell my students who are now switching to iPads and things that I had found this really neat software that they could use for free and everybody could share it and it was great. And Apple would not let them use it. So the only thing you can use on an iPad is the MuseScore reader thing, which happens to be proprietary and it just will show you things. It won't actually let you do anything. It's not the program. And I don't like that direction, so I'm freaked out about whether Apple is going to turn the Mac into something like the iPhone in the long run. And you know, they do because I tell people you should use Audacity; it's really cool. And then people say, "Oh, I tried to install it, but it gave me a warning. Something was wrong. It was a, it was a virus." Because you know, it says there's a security issue if you install this thing. It didn't come from the Mac App Store. So I could go on about that stuff, but it got me in 2012 to switch to a Linux system, and it's both very, very promising and also very troubling. So it's not as easy to use. It's not as easy to set up. There's a lot more variabilities, but there's also a lot of interesting promise. And after a decent amount of hassle figuring this out, I ended up moving to KX Studio, which is what I use today. And I will take a moment to explain to everybody what this is. There's a guy who originally lives in Portugal. I think he lives in Germany now. Uh, but KX Studio, which the K comes from the KDE desktop, but it does not, it's not a desktop specific thing, uh, actually is a set of repositories that you can add to any Debian based operating system. It just is a collection of settings for audio, a collection of plugins and tools, and a ton of really cool things super well maintained and packaged by this one guy who's basically volunteering his entire life to just doing this and is not actually even, I was kind of shocked to figure out how this even exists, but he lives on a modest, very small amount of donations and is just a guy who doesn't even have a programming background prior to getting involved in this, uh, picked up a Python book one day or something and started l learning Linux audio and he's now one of the world's Linux audio experts and packages all of the plugins and software and things that I ever need. So you don't need to install KX Studio as a distro. You can just add the repositories to any Ubuntu or Debian-based system. So if you even want a completely full FSF-endorsed, fully free software system, you could get Triskel or Debian core stuff and add the KX Studio repositories. But enough people were asking that he would release an ISO we could install and that's what I'm actually using is his little, I'm not really running a distro, I'm just trying to make these repositories, but fine, here's an ISO. And so that's what I'm running. It's Ubuntu based. And AV Linux is another thing that I'll just give a shout out to. It's based on Debian. And Fedora Jam uses a lot of the same stuff, including some of the programs that the guy who does KX Studio put together. 
uh, and that's another music distro. And there's a few others, but those are the big ones. So I will bring this slide back. Whoops. Hmm. That slide didn't show my picture that's supposed to be on that slide. It's supposed to explain the layout of. Let me see if it works if I do this, and maybe it will. Ooh. What happened? That's really strange. It's not wrecking. Glitches with my slides. Um, sorry. I will just explain. There are a whole bunch of different uh, audio backends that are involved in this, and so the standard systems come with Pulse. Uh, one other comment I'll make on the distro thing while I'm at it is that a lot of people use Ubuntu Studio or hear about that because Ubuntu is popular and you look up Ubuntu Studio. Uh, it has a few settings. It's not really super well maintained. It doesn't have all the stuff you'd want. So I don't oppose anybody using it. I would just say if you use Ubuntu Studio, you should also add the KX Studio repositories, and then you will have everything. Uh, at any rate, the KX Studio system allows me to manage all of this stuff, and I'm going to do a bit of a demo today. And so at this point, I'm going to stop and just ask if everybody could give me some sort of show of hands. How much, how many of the people here today already do use and are sort of aware of the stuff in the Linux world for making music? Okay. Uh, how many people are familiar with how Jack works? Okay, a couple of you. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and give this talk from the user perspective. This is a demo of somebody who's not a programmer, not focused on command line things, although I do now have gotten comfortable with some of that. Uh, Jack is the main thing you're going to be thinking about, but when you're talking about audio hardware, you want to deal with ALSA, and ALSA is a part of the kernel, so you don't have to worry about it. It's just a question of which hardware you have supported. So I have this Focusrite uh, USB thing that's plugged into my computer, and despite that, it is not getting rid of the buzz, but the quality is a lot nicer. But you can do a lot of stuff just with the built-in audio, just in terms of playing around. So the easiest way to visualize this is to understand how the KX Studio tools work, because they're excellent. So the first thing is this program called Cadence. And we can see here that I'm running an Ubuntu-based system, even though it's actually the KX Studio thing, and that I have a low latency kernel, which helps with dealing with the things when I want rapid response, doing stuff live. And right here is a little thing to set my CPU scaler, and I can check that I'm a user in the audio group. All this stuff is set if you just use KX Studio. And so the configuration for Jack uh, relates to the hardware, and it looks like this. And so overall, there's some engine settings, which I don't really touch very much. You can learn about that more later, but basically I have some different interfaces. So this analog interface is my built-in laptop audio, and then I have my USB audio. And if I use a duplex mode, I can actually use a different input and output if I want to play with those types of things. And then the sample rate refers to the audio rate. This is the rate of taking pressure samples if I was recording uh, from audio from my analog. And then buffer size is actually going to be how much latency I have. And that turns out to be calculated so that back here, you can see I have a latency of about 21.3 milliseconds. And so I will demonstrate for you what, that, what the effect of that type of latency is. And so I'm going to, this is the type of thing you can do with KX Studio because everything all, is all set. I can just open my thing and say, oh, I'd like to play with some, say, an organ. And wait a moment. Something is going too strangely with my computer here for some reason. This is Linux for you. Things are sometimes not as reliable as you'd hope. Why is that not loading? What is happening? Jack is going crazy on me. I see what is happening. And so this is an example of the types of glitches you may find in using Linux. This Focusrite audio interface and my computer, for some reason, and may relate to something about the power settings, uh, lost its connection. And so what I'm going to do, as this is a frustration I've had lately, is go ahead and kill the connection because Jack didn't know what to do when something went wrong with also connecting to my audio interface. And so now that I've done that, I will have to go back to here and notice that nothing is running. And that's not good. 
so is is Jack still running? No. Jack is done. What is going on? Okay, so I'm going to bring that window back. Um, that's actually even worse than I usually experience. How strange. So I'm going to unplug that and plug in my built-in sound. And what else? That is really strange. So this is the sort of craziness that sometimes happens with Linux audio, and this is not what I mean it to be. Um, oh boy, my entire computer is having trouble. Okay, and restarting my computer. This is not actually something I've even experienced before. And that does not happen typically with some other systems. I didn't used to have that problem with my Apple computers. And that relates to the snowdrift dilemma, which I'll tell you about briefly while this computer starts up. Uh, we're trying to get better funding for free software that serves everybody's interests because I don't like this situation where I have more glitches to deal with and the hardware is less well supported, but I don't like having Apple have control over my life and everything else that I do and being locked into systems that may undermine what I'm trying to do in the long run. So that's why I'm involved with snowdrift.coop. But I'm going to turn off my networking again and everybody sees that and now I'm back and here we are. Jack is running again and I'm going to not even worry about the external interface. And I will explain that if you have a different computer, you might in fact never have these troubles. But these things are hard to troubleshoot. And so the most important thing that I will bring up yet again, uh, to do, but I will emphasize right now so that it, we don't run out of time, is that I found it absolutely invaluable to have these sorts of res oh hey the file this showed up again how about that uh, so I will explain this and then I'll give a bunch to what I was saying the hardware is obviously your biggest issue and so there's tons of different things my laptop happens to be one that has been successful to do what I want it to do in some cases but there are unfortunate connections between the network and the sound and other things and you can notice this uncomfortable amount of buzz that's happening now, which is exacerbated for some reason by LibreOffice. How insane is that? Um, and on top of that, FFADO is for FireWire. Nobody really uses that anymore. OSS is outdated. Also is the main thing that everybody's using for auto, USB auto, stuff like that. And so Jack can run directly with Alsa. Uh, and in KX Studio, and the way I have it set up, I do not use Pulse Audio. It is gone. It is usually used for things that are not very applicable to music making. And so instead, I have a bridge that bridges everything through all the programs that directly support ALSA instead bridge through Jack to ALSA. And I'll explain how that works later. Uh, Phonon is also relevant. That's a KDE type of stuff that relates to routing audio. So I leave that and boy, this buzz goes, changes. Okay. But going back, uh, this, oh, wow. That's crazy. So now there you go. As long as this doesn't actually put out light, then we don't have a buzz. So I should have made my slides darker. I'm sorry for the green background. They should have been black and then the white text or something. These are the main resources I recommend to everybody. You can, of course, look these up. But Linux Audio is a great wiki that collects a lot of things and is good introductory resources. LinuxMusicians.com is a PHPBB forum that is pretty active and has people who will help you with all sorts of things, and the Open Source Musicians channel, and this great website that has all sorts of guides and things, Libre Music Production. If you don't find something on there, you will find people who will tell you where else to find some, some answer to anything. And let's make that buzz go away. Uh, I should try to use black stuff as much as I can. Okay, so I was talking about latency. And so I'm going to load up my organ, and then the question would be, how can I play it? Well, I could tap on the organ 
keys like this. Now I'll try to make this very noticeable. If I tap here and now listen to the delay, you can't really play very effectively that way. But even to make this a little more practical, I will want to plug in this external MIDI keyboard that I have. So I go to this tool here thing, and I can go to the tools, and these are all, why did I open Firefox? Because I clicked in the wrong place on my screen, move around, sorry. Uh, close that, go away Firefox. Okay, so Katya is a very simple version of this, and Claudia is one that does session management. And I'll explain that later, but the idea is that in Jack, each program has a input and an output of different sorts. In this case, uh, here is my organ. It has an input for MIDI control, an output for notifying of MIDI events that could go to something else, and output for audio. And so this is plugged into the speakers, and this is a virtual patch bay. And now, on top of all of this, I plugged in my little keyboard here, and that's this one. It's called the QNexus. And so I can plug in the QNexus to the organ, and now I can play. And there's still a bunch of latency. So I would want to go back to my settings here and say, oh, I need to have, I'm sorry for the, I didn't get a mirroring image well, uh, to change my buffer size down to something smaller. And the problem here is that depending upon the settings of your computer, you can overload the computer if you have too low of a buffer. So we'll see what happens. I'm going to try 128, which is quite a lot less than 1024. And then to make an instant change without stopping Jack, I can use this switch master button. And now you'll see down here, and I could have changed it right here, but that's another way to set this. Uh, everything seems to be working, and now here's my latency. Much better. So basically usable. Okay. And if I wanted to change that on the fly, I can do it here. And I could go back to low latency. Oh, look at that. I got 19 X runs. But it happened while I was shifting things around, so I'm not too worried about that. But if I was recording, I'd want to track those types of things, because that basically is a glitch where something got lost in the overall flow. Uh, at some level, the maximizing of, or the minimizing of X runs comes from getting powerful hardware and powerful computers and figuring out all your right settings. But it's pretty easy to track here. And so there's an organ, and I can do, there's a ton of other synths and other things I can play with. So the other tools that I'm going to highlight today are the hydrogen drum machine, which is, I think, one of the most easy to use beginner's tools. And I tend to highlight things that are cross-platform, so I can recommend them to my students who may not be on Linux, uh, although this is definitely a Linux-focused system, as you saw with the splash screen. So this is a drum machine uh, sample setup, and so I can have drum patterns, different sounds, and then you can easily just lay them out across this grid. And so here's the demo thing I had set up. Um, maybe not. What's going on with this? So I pattern mode. One of the features I like about this program especially is the ability to adjust some of the controls. There's, this is a humanizing feature. I can go to over here. Uh, change the velocity so it's not so computer rigid. It'll modulate, sometimes louder, sometimes quieter. Sounds a little more interesting. I could actually modulate the timing a little bit. Doesn't sound quite as rigid that way. And I can turn on and off the amount of swing. And then you can actually add plugins and effects. And so it's actually a pretty powerful, easy to use thing. Now let's see how this is working. In the case of hydrogen here, I have this, each of these samples is just a uh, layer here, which is just a recording. And so 
in this, you can actually edit uh, each of these uh, instruments. So I can actually go ahead and put my own samples in any audio that I want, and then you can actually change all sorts of settings. So you can basically create your own sample sets and then trigger them in any arbitrary way. And then I can also create songs. So in this case, there's like the syncopated version. I can say, oh, I want it to do this three times, and then do that one for the fourth time, and play that out as a song, and I can make this long thing go ahead. And I can, of course, change the tempo. Or so, very cool program, Hydrogen Drum Machine. I recommend that to everybody. Uh, it comes with sets of drum tracks that people have put together that are freely licensed. And so you can, in fact, contribute your own sample sets, and we could potentially, if more people contribute to this, build a whole library of wonderful samples that people can use in their music. And so what's really cool about Jack is that maybe I want to do something very different from that. I want to use something like MuseScore, where I'm doing music notation. And so in this case, this is at the point of a completely fully professional level music notation program. So let's start a piece of music. What should we call it? OK. Scale. Ah, if I can type. And of course, we need to say, because that's the most important thing on any piece of music. And we will move on. And we say, let's choose some instruments. Uh, somebody name an instrument you'd like me to use. OK, trombone is brass. There we go, trombone, add. Let's just do a trombone. That'll be enough for now. Uh, we'll just go with whatever key, I don't care. And let's have a pickup measure. And it'll be 4-4. Four, four. Uh, let's go with. Uh, I'm going to stick with 4-4, four, four and I'll explain why, why later. I like, and this is actually an issue of free software and tools. I don't like how tools would put you into this. This program it can do anything rhythmically. It's fantastic. Hydrogen can also do some things, but I wish somebody would come along and better support odd rhythms in hydrogen. And so if I'm going to try to connect this with other things, I will have to do some funny tweaking, like pretend that hy to hydrogen that I only actually have five eighth notes in a measure or something, or whatever else, and then I'll have to say that there's actually really slow tempo, or do some tweaks you can do. And it's possible, but it's not the same thing as hydrogen doing all of the odd time stuff that I wish it could do. So somebody please add that to hydrogen. Question? No, no, hydrogen is more flexible than that, but let me explain, I'll explain briefly. So you have this size, and it's like eight eighth notes, and then there's a certain sort of resolution for where I put these in. And so I could say, for example, that I want the resolution to be these triplet options, or off, which is putting them anywhere, and then I can use any of these sizes. There's 11 eighth notes, or whatever, so any number. So I could do something like that, but that's in a set time uh, frame. So it's basically saying there's this eighth note thing that's thought of as a certain level in the hierarchy, and you can just have an arbitrary amount of those, but that doesn't mean I can do the types of things I could do in MuseScore, where I could nest quintuplets inside something else, or I could have 5-4 and then switch to 4-4, four, four, or whatever else. Instead, it's more like this grid, but yes, the grid isn't st stuck to 4-4. Four, four. So it's something, but it's free software. People should help improve it and make it more flexible. At any rate, I'm going to do something in... Uh, actually, I'm, how is that going to work if I do the... I think I'm going, to not get, I'm going to get rid of this measure. We're not going to have the pickup measure. I like that idea, but I'll make this simpler and we'll get rid of it. OK, so here's my trombone. And I'm going to show you a brief intro to how to use MuseScore. This is the easiest thing to use. It's a fantastic program. N for note entry mode. And then name a letter. What key should we be in? I don't know. We're in C. OK. What was that? B flat. B flat. OK, so I'm going to do a C. There's a C. And then I'll say, I want a B, and I'm going to hit B, but I'll put it down, and there's a flat. And I can just type out letters this way, and we can just do interesting rhythms by clicking up here, and that actually goes along with the number keypad. So one, two, three, four, five, whatever, different numbers. And then I can quickly type in whatever I want. And so I can say, that was nice, but I don't want it to do a little fun run or something. So I'll go with the G, and oh, I really wanted it to be the higher G. Just control up, and I go to a different G. And I don't know, let's go with an F and a... G and an E flat or something, and now we're like in C minor. And so, I don't know, I'll go back to the longer thing and we'll do a B flat again. How about. Whoops. There we go, it's B flat. Okay. And so let's see what that sounds like. Hey, the drums played. How about that?
That's because in hydrogen, there's this thing called jack transport, which knows where I am in the song, and I can choose which thing sets the master. So in this case, it moved to 120 because that's our muse score was set. But I may want hydrogen to be the master, and so I'm going to set this to a slower tempo maybe, and say I want it to be like 80, and we'll go back to the beginning and play our song here. And that sort of worked, except that the tempo from MuseScore didn't actually adjust. So let's see, preferences, I go to IO, I'm in Jack, use Jack MIDI, time base master. So I think I need to tell it that it is not the master now, hydrogen is the master. Let's see if that works. I have to go back to the beginning. And there we go. So you can actually create a thing where we, we were doing is, and I'll go back to the view where you can see where everything is plugged in. Muse score is plugged in to the output so that I'm hearing the sound. And the organ is plugged into the output so I could be playing the organ live at the same time. And hydrogen is plugged in here. And so I've got all these different things. But notice there's an interesting Muse score MIDI output. So maybe I want the organ to play those notes I just added for the trombone. And so I'll just have it send the MIDI out there. Let's see how that works. I just play it from any of these. Actually, I think I can play it right here. Here's the transport. Watch this. Yeah, I hear like a funny organ background there. Maybe if I add some crazy high, you'll hear it more clearly if I do something else with the organ. So let's see. I'll put in some higher register or something. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what that'll do, but let's go back to Muse score, and I'll put something stupidly high up here. Um, I'm going to do something relatively arbitrary, so aleatoric sort of new uh, avant-garde music here. Um, let's see. Oh, that's a too slow. Let's go with uh, uh, eight notes, sure. Uh, that's enough. Okay, and maybe I want to take this, I'll move it up an octave or something so I hear it in Oregon better. I don't know what that'll do, but we'll just see what happens. Uh, back to some place where I'll play. There we go, I got an organ. And so MuseScore is sending stuff out to an organ. Now I could, do, of course, put this on a separate MuseScore track, and we could have MuseScore sending some track to an organ, so I don't have to use MuseScore's built-in sounds. And then I can have it playing the drums with hydrogen. And I could even have MuseScore send audio output, uh, MIDI, MIDI output, I'm sorry, into a... Where am I? Uh, here's, it, it's separated in this case, but here's a hydrogen MIDI track. So if I wanted to make a drum track, this is how I would use hydrogen or hydrogen's drum samples in a more interesting rhythmic sense. I could create any sort of drum line in MuseScore and output the MIDI from that into hydrogen, and then that will actually play just like everything else. Yes, question? Yeah. So I could put any arbitrary rhythm in MuseScore and have hydrogen play it. And of course, I could do that at the same time as hydrogen is playing in other ways, but uh, it's pretty flexible. So this is all a modular system. It's kind of the Unix philosophy of you can mix and match any tool that you want. One of the other tools that I'm going to highlight at this point would be um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and use uh, I'm going to turn the volume down just in case because I don't remember if it's the presets are going to do what I want them to do. But I use often this program called GuitarX, which is a virtual guitar synthesizer. Now, it is in fact picking up my sound and doing all sorts of crazy things right now, which I don't really want it to do. Uh, that didn't work. Oh, there we go. Uh, maybe? No. It's a little hard to see on this small screen. But uh, I'll just get rid of the plugins bar and there. Okay, so I've got a virtual guitar amp, and this is a, it's picking up my voice and it's telling me whether I'm tuned. Uh, and then we can set up the gains and all sorts of other effects, and 
I could, if I had a setup right now where I was going to use headphones and I didn't have this thing on so I wasn't worried about all sorts of other stuff, I could route this through and maybe even live sing something into the guitar thing or I could plug in my guitar through my uh, interface. But for now, just to make it simple, uh, let's just plug the organ into the guitarix drum machine, a uh, guitarix thing, uh, drum machine. Um, so I'm going to go back to Katya and we'll take our organ, where is it? Uh, here we are, set B3. And I'm going to unplug it from the output here, so I don't want that directly. I'm also going to go ahead and make sure to unplug the microphone from GuitarX. And then I'm going to plug in the organ into GuitarX and see what that sounds like. Now I can go ahead and play live because I already have my controller from QNexus going into the organ. Uh, let's see. That should be working. That's working. Why are these down? Oops. Okay, glitches of changing programs too quickly. Okay, so that's working. Um, there's that. And I think if I now just turn my volume back up, you will hear it. Okay, so I can go back to GuitarX now and pick some sort of interesting preset. So for the heck of it, let's go with a, uh, let's go with something kind of crazy. A little loud. Turn the volume down a little bit, but you get the idea. In that case, it's a very powerful amplifier, and so it can be used for a very hard rock sorts of sounds, but it can also do a number of other things. And so in this case, we have EQs and multiband compressors and all sorts of other reverbs, and all this stuff is available as plugins in recording equipment as well. So obviously it would be possible now, although it's not a perfect sort of setup, I could go back to MuseScore, and let's delete this little strange thing, and I'll just do a copy and paste for now, although there's other ways to do this. And make a little loop go on. Obviously could edit that a bunch. And we've got... I forgot that I had that plugged into the organ. So let's go ahead to unplug MuseScore from the organ and just let it play the trombone. Go ahead and play. Okay. And I could play live along with my little thing. I would have loved to have had all of these things with my juggling my attention being a little smoother, but I think you get the idea. So I'm going to pause for just a second. Uh, does anybody have any questions at this point? Yes. Um, yes. So it is a MIDI connection. As I showed you, I could send an output from uh, MuseScore or anything else or any other drum program or MIDI sequencer, uh, of which there are several. And so you could do the same thing where just like I have, uh, let, me, let me give you a very quick demonstration. If I go back to my thing here, I have my controller right now set into the organ. But instead, let's go ahead and plug it into hydrogen. So I can play the hydrogen sounds on my controller right now. Yeah, absolutely. And so the real question, though, is in terms of how we want to output all of this. So you can see that there's, we're connecting a lot of stuff. And the question now is, 
let's say I had some combination of my playing live and a bunch of composed things, and I want to output this and have some finished recording. Well, let's start with a first earlier statement. Maybe I like something of what I did today, but I'm not going to actually want to record this because this is not very interesting. This is a bunch of garbage, but I like some pieces of it. So I want to save this for later, and what do I do? I don't want to have to set up all of this stuff again. And so that's where session management comes in. And so there's not a perfect support for this because some programs support it better than others, and there's a couple different session managers. But the one that comes with KX Studio, well, actually, there's a couple ones. Uh, one of them is called Claudia, and it's sort of a more, it includes a broader set of things than the one we were just doing just now. But in, uh, just a moment, okay, in Claudia, I actually have this set up here with a default internal name in terms of my overall studio, and I can load different studios, and a studio is sort of a set, like you have all of everything all saved together. And what you can do is you can also create little rooms where you have certain sets of things plugged in together. And so in your overall application, I can use Claudia to specifically tell Claudia that I want it to use a particular program like Hydrogen or Muse, or I could have this recording program, Ardor, which is an excellent, which is generally the most popular uh, audio recording program. So one option would be that I take my results and I just play it and have uh, plug everything into Ardor and have it record. That's one option. I wouldn't suggest that one particularly. Uh, but basically, I can tell Claudia here, I didn't do this before, but if I was starting this plan, I would tell it I want hydrogen. And then Claudia would know not only that I have hydrogen plugged into whatever, but that I wanted hydrogen as one of the things it tracks. And then when I save my studio, it knows that hydrogen should be opened, it should be this, pro, this file, particular drum pattern that I saved with hydrogen, and hydrogen should be plugged into this, and this thing should be plugged in there. And the entire session is saved so that when I open it again, it will start hydrogen, choose the right file, and plug it into all the right things, and I'm just back to where I started. So that's how you save and come back. Now there's a thing called non-session manager, which is an alternative one that actually in some ways works a little better, but there's pros and cons. What I actually do is take my basic setup, which is like what hardware setting I'm using. I, I have my focus right or whatever else, and I save that in Claudia, and then I use non-session manager to keep track of where all the jack plugins are and which programs I want, because it does a little bit better managing of the particular, like I can do command line arguments for a particular thing. Uh, any questions about that? Is that clear? Okay, so if I wanted to actually then output my thing, I would use the render program. And so the render, oops, sorry. The render program allows me to simply say, I want to start at this particular time in the overall song, and it's going to end at whatever, in this case, two minutes, 30 seconds, and so it's whatever my length of time is, and I can actually hit play and be, you know, jump to the end of the song in Hydrogen or in MuseScore and just say now, and then I choose my format, of Wave or whatever else, and bit depth and those things, and real time means that I basically hit play and what this actually does, and I will show you briefly, is if you'll notice over here, my, this bit is my hardware. All of this stuff ends up plugged into here. That's where the final output comes in. So when I hit render, uh, this is fine, I can just do this. Whoa, stop. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, so I will explain what happened. What happened was it re-plugged in Guitarix. It, for some reason, thought that Guitarix was supposed to be plugged into there, and non-session manager would have actually handled that better, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Uh, but what that did, briefly, <laughs> I turned it off. Um, let me see. I can, uh, okay, I have the volume down, so I'll try that again. Uh, render, where is that? Did I close it? I may have closed it. Okay, I'll try that again. Render. I will go back to here. And where's Guitarix? Uh, okay, we're still plugged in there, so I don't want that feedback, so I will unplug that. 
but you'll notice that there is now something called Jack Capture. And Jack Capture automatically connected itself to a ton of things. Basically, everything that was plugged into the uh, speaker output got plugged into Jack Capture automatically as the thing plays. And so that program actually then captures the output that the computer is playing and renders it to a file. I will stop that because I don't care about that right now. Okay, so all of this is mostly talking about plugging things into different things, effects, synthesizers, MIDI types of stuff, and doesn't necessarily focus on live audio, although I did a little bit of that. So I'm going to focus on that now, and we have the most basic tool that everybody should use for if you're doing some audio recording at all, it's Audacity. Uh, how many people are familiar with Audacity? Seems like most everybody. So I'll give you a quick run through of how this fits in. Uh, Audacity is an absolutely fascinating program. It does all sorts of interesting recordings, and it supports Jack in that here Jack is chosen, and I can use whatever inputs I want. I can check that it's in fact hearing me clearly enough, whoops, or not, because it crashed on me for some reason. Why did it do that? Uh, okay, so there's a funny little glitch here. Audacity is not a full-blown Jack supporting program. It uses Jack, but you'll see this funny little thing, port audio, what is that? Maybe I need to clean up this canvas because it looks a little bit funny. So I will refresh. That went away. That was there for a second. Uh, so that you don't see Audacity. There's no Audacity in here. What's going on? I'm going to record something, and here we are. I'm talking. That's working, obviously. And I go back. It, no, it's not there. Huh. Well, let's try this again. I'm going to... Re where? How did it get that sound? I'm recording something. And look, there's this funny thing called port audio, and it's plugged into my microphone. And I could have plugged it into something else, because if I wanted to make an audio recording of the drums or something. But when I hit stop, it goes away. So it's only got a temporary thing, and I can't use Audacity in a way where I plug it into different things. VLC works the same way. It will interact with Jack, but I can't actually use it as one of these session tools along with everything else. So I use Audacity primarily if I want to go in and do fine audio editing or play with crazy things or do something like my favorite effect, which, well, let me move this up so that it's a little easier to see. Um, I hope that didn't work. I guess it puts it up there because I have another screen up there at real I think I have. What was that? Yes. And it also includes the, a very simple version of this crazy thing called Paul Stretch, where I can say that I would like to stretch my little recording of myself talking by a factor of, say, 200. Uh, maybe I won't worry about that right now. I'll show you in a moment. Um, Paul Stretch is amazing. So here's what you could do with Paul Stretch. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, I'll give you a very simple example. So this is a quirky thing that I just love, so I'm going to show off. Uh, I'm going to record something quietly. That's enough. And I'm going to save it. Uh, there's a built-in version of this. You know, that was short enough. Maybe I'll try that Paul Stretch thing here. Now, I'll show you the real one. So there's a very simple version of Paul Stretch built into uh, Audacity. But if I export my file as a wave, that's fine. That's good enough. Desktop. Okay. And, uh, okay. Now I'm going to open this crazy awesome program that is not installed by default, but is in the KX Studio repository. So if you want to add this and you have the KX Studio repositories, you can just add it. It's called Paul's Extreme Sound Stretch. And, whoa, what happened? That's interesting. Uh, okay. <laughs> I got rid of the buzz. That was funny. So I'm going to open my audio file I just made, uh, which I saved on my desktop. It was called test. Okay. And let's see if that works. Um, so it's right now set to a stretch factor of 8. And so it's going to take that little, very short thing I made and spread it out over 32 seconds. So 
it creates a very interesting ambient textures. And you can see what you can do with actual things like a song that you like or an orchestra piece or some chords you would strum on a guitar or anything else. And so these interesting ambient textures will follow the, the pitch of everything that's going on. Some of that feedback that we were hearing is actually that I should close Audacity probably. Whoops. Um, no, I don't care about that. And what's going on? I need to go back to here. Something is feeding back. What's going on? The guitar it's got plugged into the thing again. Is that what happened? Don't do that. Okay. I should probably just quit guitar X. At some level, even though I would have loved all of this to be perfectly smooth, what I want to give is an accurate experience of using Linux audio. You need some patience, and some things will be glitchy, and this is how it is. And I hope that it will keep improving. I'm very, very happy with today's state of things compared to how it was a couple of years ago. Uh, so here's Paul Stretch again. Without the feedback. Okay. Oh, no, I'm getting feedback again. What's happening? Why, why am I getting feedback? Guitarix got plugged into the microphone again. Well, that's crazy. Okay, so I don't know what, why that's happening. What I'm going to do is quit Guitarix. Go away. <laughs> and we will now check out Paul's Extreme Sound Stretch for real. Much more satisfying. Interesting sound there. So that's a factor of eight. And if I was to know that the thing was going to evolve in a certain way, I could actually play very interesting music against that or on top of that. Yeah, okay. So here's my factor of eight. I could stretch that out. Let's keep going. Oh, maybe a factor of et cetera. Okay, we'll make it last three minutes. And I could go on and on, and the thing will go, oh, we can make it last. Oh, let's go with an hour and 22 minutes for those two notes that I hummed. Now, the thing that is really interesting about this program, because this is the sort of silly things programmers might get into doing, is you can do something called hyperstretch, which takes another level of this. And so it can start off at kind of modest levels, like, oh, we'll stretch that out to um, two hours or something. But let's keep going, and I could be like, oh, you know, let's do, let's do that. It'll take 40 days to go through that. And uh, you can see where I am in this slider. So somebody just was being silly with their parameters here, because if I keep going, <laughs> anyway, um, I won't hit play now. We won't worry about that. But even in the regular stretch mode, uh, this, this software is a lot of fun, and you can do a, some very interesting things in terms of adjusting the process. So I can change the overall octave filth mixer here. Um, and I can do some interesting things with the tonal versus noise selection here. So, more towards the pure pitch, or more towards the noisy, ambient sort of sound. Anyway, so I think it's a very interesting ambient sound creator, and this is an obscure thing most people don't know about or highlight. Uh, and that does not do anything with Jack. I had to save the audio and then open it up but I could then put that into a program in which I then integrate it with everything else. And the program that I would use for that would be Ardor. And so Ardor is a really, truly professional digital audio workstation. It includes some level of MIDI stuff. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and make a new session. And we're going to put it on my desktop and just call it test. And in this case, I can set up all sorts of neat things 
Now, on a very basic level, if you don't even have all this other stuff installed and you just use Ardor, the newest version works directly with Ulsa and you can skip all the Jack stuff. I, of course, like using Jack best because I can integrate it with all these things, but it can sort of be a monolithic thing where you just put everything in Ardor. My understanding is the actual creator of Ardor is the same guy who made Jack, who later on decided that it was kind of crazy to deal with Jack and people were doing all sorts of weird things with it and he was going to create this monolithic thing instead. But it certainly supports Jack and so everything is, can be used however you like. Uh, so, open. Da, da, da. There, let's see if this works. Where's, where is it? There it is. But on my screen, so I'll drag it down. Uh, I think I'll drag it down. Can I do this? What's going on? Bam. Okay. So Ardor is a full-blown digital audio workstation. I can add an audio track. I can put whatever I want in there. I can record stuff. And if I want to record, you then enable the recording, and then you hit play, and now I'm recording. And when I'm done, you can have this audio, which you can do very simple fading, and you can go ahead and edit the audio. You can also do some levels of time stretch. I uh, move things around, all that stuff. If you're familiar with that, basically we can mix and match all sorts of tracks. And it's a very high level, high quality program uh, we can do mixing, and then it also does relate to the Jack stuff. So in here, this internal thing is telling you that it's just a monolithic thing doing its own thing. But I could switch to Jack, and now it will follow the time frame, and it will choose whoever is the master, and it will follow the tempo settings. So I could go in here and say, oh, I want the tempo to change to a 5-4 time signature over here, and I want it to become a different speed. And then it will adjust those things in all the other programs. And so it integrates very nicely, is high quality, and I have a mixer here where I can add all sorts of plugins. So one way to do this would be to just go ahead and look at all the tons of plugins I got. All of this is because KX Studio set me up with all these things. I didn't have to think about it. And I could add this synthesizer, or I could add limiter, or I could add all these other cool filters or, or choices for whatever I want to do. And Sometimes all of that's the most appropriate because I want to actually edit the audio in Ardor and set up automation and do all the other things that people would do. So people use this for professional recordings on you know, live bands or any of the other types of use like that. Uh, but I'm going to pause for a moment. Does anybody have any questions or anything particular you would like to know about Ardor? Yes? Uh, no, not the full functionality. So Audacity will allow you to go in and do sample, you know, per sample edits, like all of the noise reduction, all of the, you can deal with a quick detail. You're doing very fine waveform things. I would always go to Audacity for that. But it includes everything you would ever want to do with general, you know, slicing and putting in different things in sections and some level of manipulating the audio. Um, let me be a little more specific. Audacity is a waveform editor. It is about going into the raw data of there is this exact waveform. It went to this exact sequence sampler level at whatever, and we're going to manipulate that stuff. And this is about mixing uh, different tracks together and editing them in a creative sort of a song way and integrating a bunch of different effects and then automating that. It should get louder here and all these other things. Yeah. Uh, depending upon who you are, I would not say that. Uh, I would say if you are a beginner who doesn't know anything, that you would start playing with Audacity because you would just want to make some recordings and play with them. But if you were just even, even for a beginner, if you knew that what you wanted to do was put together interesting compositions and you wanted to use audio, not just MIDI compositions, so you're not just writing in Muse score or in a sequencer, uh, you would use Ardor. And you would start with Ardor, you would make your recordings, and then if you found that there was a particular thing where you were like, I want to play this bit of the audio backwards, and then I want it to have this particular quirky fade, then you would open it in Audacity and you would edit that audio for that use. So mostly you use Audacity for these fine-tuning things of the audio details itself, and you do almost all of the composition in Ardor. Ardor is really the competitor to something like Pro Tools or Logic or these other programs that are big, massive digital audio workstations is the term DAW.
Any other questions about this? So I'm going to move on and highlight one of the other things that the amazing guy who puts together KX Studio is doing. And it's a program called Carla. And Carla is itself a plugin manager, basically. So what we have is a, all these plugins that are installed in the system. Ardor could put them into the mixer internally. Ardor, uh, other programs like uh, GuitarX can have all sorts of plugins. In fact, you can use plugins inside uh, Hydrogen. But sometimes you just want it to be an independent thing that you can mix and match wherever you like. And so in this case, you just add a plugin. Um, sorry again, screen issues. Uh, just add a plugin from the list. So for reference, this is the here's the list of plugins that we've got with KX Studio. It's quite a long list. Uh, most of them are usable or interesting. Some of them are sort of just funny and quirky. And so. Let's say I wanted a organ. I could find that the organs I've got available, notice I do not see that one that I was using before, which is sort of an independent jack supporting but standalone organ. It's not a plug-in. This, some of these are also available that way, but there's the CAF Studio Gear, um, where's the name, why is, sorry, is, oh, here scrolled over. Okay, there we are. So the name is these. We have the calf organ, the, oh, there it is. So there's a set B3. That's the same organ I was using before. It is available as a plugin. And then there's a different organ, and there's the calf organ. So I'll just choose that one. And now we have this rack in which I can open the GUI and set all of the organ settings, and it's quite nice if you want to go into all those details. Uh, you could also edit in the uh, functional, sort of this is the internal universal, you know, just set all of the stuff. So some of these have nice GUIs and some of them don't. And this connects, here's the patch bay again. I now have um, my, uh, that's the other organ. I have my calf organ here and it's not plugged into anything. But I could plug in the output. Let's hear what that sounds like. So let's see. Not Back to off the system. There we are. So I'm going to plug in my system. And now, if in this view, it's very interesting. I click this, I actually have a keyboard down here. And so this can now be plugged in, much like everything else. It's an independent thing, but this is not a, uh, an application that normally is a standalone application. So this allows me to set up any arbitrary sets of racks of instruments that I can save their presets and I can save them as a unit and then all of them show up in jack. And so that way I could add a reverb that I want to plug any of my other arbitrary jack things into. I could set up basically any type of thing from all of the plugin lists and use them independently whether I want them accessible in Ardor or somewhere else. So there's a lot of modularity there and he's got some crazy amounts of features here that I don't haven't even explored. Uh, in terms of the ways that this will work. I happen to use this often for one of the very few non-free software things that I ever use, which I wish was free software, but I can't convince my friend who makes this to make it free software because he doesn't quite get it yet. Uh, and uh, anyway, I can understand in certain ways. So I often use this to show off this plugin ReJS, which actually comes from the proprietary software uh, it's called Reaper is the DAW, which is a Windows Mac based DAW. And they have this plug-in thing called Jesus Sonic, which is like a programming language that this thing is written in. And then this thing is a wrapper for that. So because I don't want to subject myself to Windows and Microsoft, but I still want access to this particular tool, I can use this wrapper inside Carla and then open this up and get my view here where I'm going to open up Alt Tuner. And now I can plug this in as a MIDI thing in my rack. And what this particular program does is that if I, actually I'm going to make this a little simpler so that you can actually experience this. Uh, I'm going to quit. Uh, no, oops. 
wrong thing to quit. I'm going to close. Just quit. Okay. And I'll quit that. Okay, so I'm going to use. Uh, I would actually like to use Helm. I'm going to try it that way. So there's a. Oh, sorry. Uh, discard. Bloop, I didn't save it. Oh well. Uh, so this wonderful synthesizer called Helm. The guy who makes this is somebody I've actually had a chance to talk to recently, which is my favorite thing about the entire Linux audio world, is that I actually get to talk to different people. And so I know that I'm actually, I think I'm running out of time here. Yeah. Okay. So the last little bit of here is that if I plug in, if I plug in uh, the, where was it? Not calf organ. Um, all right, not that one. The uh, oh, it's the MIDI throughput. I do the MIDI through to Helm. I think that will work. Oh no, ReJS. There it is. Okay, so ReJS will output to Helm, and then I can plug in my controller to ReJS, and I don't want it to be plugged in here or here. And now, okay, um, it's a little bit quiet, but uh, I hope you can hear this clearly. This will be the last little hint of something ReJS. Uh, do, no. Okay, Helm. Helm needs to be just a little louder. Where's the volume? Do you see a general output? Where is it? Ah, uh, here. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you can tell, but this is actually now in just intonation. Whereas if they did not use that E, for example, and I used the wrong E that would not fit as well, Helm is doing is Helm is a synthesizer. This is actually a different tuning. And so I can actually tune my pitches to be whatever I want them to be. And this is not written specifically for Linux, but I'm running actually through Wine because Carla supports Wine so that I can run plugins that would work in a Windows system under VST. And I can actually run them under Linux because Cake Studio actually has all of that support. And so I can use this program to actually play in just intonation and to play with alternate tunings that will get me all sorts of different things that you can't get with a standard tempered system. And there's a ton of interesting other programs I would like to show off, but the point at the end of the day is we have a lot of options if you're willing to be patient and play with it in how to do very interesting creative things, and I've barely touched the surface of this. Um, so I wish we had more time. I could go on all day, but it's, uh, thanks for hanging out and getting the introduction. What's the, what's the deal with timing? Okay, there's an hour before the next session. Okay, so I can, take, I can hang out for some questions. Do you want me to start with the point where I didn't know how Linux worked, or the part where I was able to like start programs and things, but like I didn't actually, I mean, I'm not sure, I mean, <laughs> right. Mm. So I, I think, I will put it this way, the tools have improved a lot. When I first started, just even getting the hardware set up was harder than it is now. Uh, these things that this KX Studio guy is putting together, all those tools I was showing you, uh, it used to be that there was much clunkier looking things that were harder to mess with and harder to understand what was what, and you couldn't click the thing and just reset that. Uh, it, it's a much easier thing today than it had been in the past. There's still room to improve. Uh, but 
I think that somebody who's comfortable with Linux and you know, knows how to basically manage, find their way around, could do useful things today. And when I say useful things today, I mean if you add KX Studio repositories to your system, you upload your, you know, download the things so you have your software, you could start MuseScore and you could go ahead and write a song. Uh, it's really that simple. Now, integrating all of the things is a different question. I highlighted these things that I think are, is, are that easy to get going. Hydrogen just works. Uh, MuseScore is professional level. Ardor is, works. It's just fantastic. Now, there are tons of other things that really were quirky, and you notice that I had to restart my computer at one point, and I decided to give up on using my Focusrite thing. And what I would have liked, although I just partly traveling, I didn't bring a guitar or something and play something else live. Uh, and the music that I put out wasn't, I didn't blow your mind with it be doing amazing things. I'm an incredible musician. You don't really have any clue what sort of music I could make because I spent this much time just fiddling with stuff. Uh, but it's, it's really not that, that hard. Uh, I think there are places where you'll run into little glitches. So if you want to get comfortable with the session management part where you set up all this stuff, but then you want to save it, uh, you'd probably have to read some things. It'll take you an hour to get comfortable and then You'll, you'll get good at it after a little bit. Uh, I definitely recommend non-session manager. I think a lot of this has to do with choosing the right tools, and there are people who have, I have a friend who does stuff on, on Arc Linux, so he doesn't have KX Studio, and he has to sort of pick and choose all the different things, and I don't actually know how he works. But I'm not saying he doesn't work, he just I don't know how he does it. I'm running, I will say I am running KX Studio, because I went and said, I don't want to think about all this stuff, this guy who put this together, including it being a KDE desktop, which I'm happy with, he went ahead and put out an ISO built on Ubuntu, and I was just like, okay, I'll use that. And that's the system I installed, even though you can add KX Studio to anything. Yeah? Do you have anything to play that is something that you compose that... <laughs> sure. Um, you can show us what you can do. Yeah. Go, good question? Well, I'm pulling that up. Uh, any MIDI, this one happens to be a QNexus, it's very portable and a and, uh, little bit higher pricey because it's actually aftertouch sensitive, it's by Keith McMillan. Uh, my favorite controller I think that I would sort of be happy to encourage, promote for anybody that I don't have myself yet is the Linstrument by Roger Lin because it is a, it's a uh, ribbon style controller but three dimensional pressure this way and up and down for different settings and it's a MIDI controller, and the thing about it that's amazing is he actually made the software open source, and so you can actually go ahead and do amazing things with this, and I would love to see the community improve it and work on it, and that's one of the very first times I've seen anything like that in the music hardware world. They go for about $1,300 or something. I think I want to get one even though it's, uh, because it's totally ama amazing. But you can get little controllers like this for cheap. Uh, not this particular one, this one's a couple hundred, but you can get a $50 controller that's workable. This Focusrite is the uh, Scarlett 2i2. Um, the basic Scarlett series is all supporting Linux quite well. Uh, the, audio, uh, the purpose of an audio interface is to have a much better hardware than the built-in microphones and things on my computer. So that, even that thing I did with Paul Stretch, I was just using my laptop thing because I ended up with a glitch for this and I didn't want to wait. But if I had used this, I would use it with my higher quality condenser microphone and I could get much better higher quality sound. Uh, it's called a, an, overall, this is an audio interface, and this is a Focusrite uh, Scarlett series. Uh, an audio interface will plug in professional level microphones, it will give you the right plugs to plug into professional sound equipment, and go through USB, and then you just have to set that up. Uh, and different audio interfaces, like this case, uh, allow, work with my computer well enough that I can get very nice low latency and decent quality sound. Mm -hmm. So, let's see. Uh, you know, back uh, music. Let's see. What sort of stuff can I share with you briefly? Stuff that I've done in this, and I could open up a full thing, but I don't want to have don't have time for that right now. Um, let's see. New. No, new stuff. New recordings. Um, 
say yes. Um, it's a good question. Uh, they're not responsive enough for nice live playing in some ways, but I actually got a touch sensitive a touch display myself specifically to use a program called DIN, which I think is amazing and I just didn't get a chance to highlight today. Uh, it's a fully microtonal, amazing, fluid, uh, basically inspired by creating super amazing uh, synthesizer, modern, computerized stuff built on Indian classical music ideas and has sort of like particular pitch statements that you can spread in whatever way and then glide between them smoothly. And it's crazy interesting stuff. Uh, so the thing is, it was started by a Linux guy who based, this is an interesting story I'll make brief about the free software world and about the nature of free software and why I'm working on snowdrift.coop, which I can talk all day about. Uh, the guy who started this is basically some guy who wanted to make really interesting music software and he made one of the most amazing pieces of music software ever. I, okay, we have a moment. I'm going to show you Din. Um, this is a separate side, but uh, why did that not work? Let's see. Let's do it this way. I will show you what Din does. Oh, damn it. I, for some reason, I must have reinstalled my system. I, apparently, I don't have it installed right now. I'm going to enable networking and install it. Uh, it won't take long because it's in the KX Studio repositories, and that makes everything really easy. I don't know why I don't have it installed. That's crazy. Uh, it just might, must have been when I updated my system. Okay, so I'll tell you what Din does in a moment after I finish setting that up. What was that? Um, so let me clarify my little story. So this program that I'm about to sh that I'll show you in a second is built by a guy who basically was just had no income at all and just wanted to spend all day working on this program and he believed in free software so he decided it needed to be a free software program and he read it was just Linux only. And it's a really cool thing and it runs on any Linux system. And after a while he was basically like I'm poor and I'm starving and I don't want to go get some shitty corporate job and I want to work on my software so he made a Mac and Windows release of the thing and made it proprietary and kept working on that and so the Linux thing fell behind. And then more recently he basically got really angry about people complaining about how he wants to spend his time working on his program and he wants to have food and, uh, and, and, and they complain about him you know, not making it free software. And so I had to talk to him and try to clarify that like, no, we, like, I want him funded, I want him to have food, I want him to keep working on this, but I also want it to be free software. And so if enough people would support him, otherwise he would be happy to make it free software. And his basic statement is he will never ever make it proprietary software for Linux because he doesn't think that's right for the community, but he wants it to be proprietary software for Windows and Mac and whatever else, and he spends time on that. So the Linux system being open source, if it was fully free software, then somebody could port it to Mac or something and you know, then it, we, he wouldn't have his proprietary controls on that. So the Linux system, the Linux version is basically behind. But the new version, he added like craziness that's bizarro and all these things that fly all over the place and the, it's, it's a bizarre system. So, um, but he's a good example of the type of thing we deal with in free software because he's, he was, I mean, we're talking literally somebody who was like sleeping on somebody's couch and trying to spend, figure out how to work on making the software. And the software works like this. Here's Din. And, uh, Let's see, what do I do? I forget what the particular controls are. I haven't messed with this in a while. Oops. That's not what I wanted to do. Welcome to Dinner's Noise. Okay, oh, I have to click something. I'm a donor. I did all, I am actually a donor. So there's all these things that are like a drone here. And I can select these and delete them. Uh, what is it, C? Yeah. This is how whatever I had it set when I was last using this. Um, do I see some other things here? I'll delete that. Is there something else over here? Uh, up there. Um, okay. So the core version of how this works is that I can go into a input mode.
There's my flat three, tuned to just intonation. And so I can make my little um, drone things. And then I can go back to here and go. And of course I can play on this on a touch screen or whatever else too. And the entire thing, if I went to the different modes or something that this does, and I forget how it all works uh, at the moment, uh, it's all based on Bezier curves. And so you can create waveforms with Bezier curves to create any type of sound control and synthesis that interacts in all of these different ways to create amazing fluid melodies that work against any sorts of drone. And so I absolutely adore this software. It's completely amazing, mind-blowing stuff. Um, how do I leave it? Forget how to quit the program. Uh, let's see. Boop. Okay. Um, yeah. And so I'm very happy about that. But there was one last request to hear some music that I made, so... Um, let's see, where am I? Uh, I'll go with this. I was hanging out with some other friend and we did some stuff. Here's a drum beat that was in seven, uh, done in hydrogen with some synthesizer stuff and then some guitar. That's the sense of that. There's live bass, uh, various other things. That was recorded in Ardor with hydrogen drums and a synthesizer and live guitar and some other things like that. Um, whereas, like, this is another track that we did. Uh, this is mostly live recordings uh, mixed in Ardor. Everything I ever do is under CC by SA. I, it's, uh, so I have a, um, I can go back to, I should go back to just a second. Uh, so I have a website, this is my personal website, wolftoon.com, and there's links to some of these things. I'm working to get up other stuff, a lot of it's older. Uh, this particular piece, I was really thrilled that somebody used this. It's, uh, as I said, I do everything Creative Commons, attribution, share alike. I think all music and all culture should be under that license. And uh, so somebody actually made a video about like making chutney or something. There's some people from Brazil, and they use this as their backing track. And it was, uh, so yeah, uh, free culture. I'm always happy to talk about those things, too. And I've done a lot of other things. I've dabbled with electronic music and a number of other things, but this is, uh, yeah. So I made music with Linux. It works. Yeah. So yes, but nothing that does it very smoothly, unless you have a special guitar controller that makes the guitar translate into a MIDI thing. Um, and there's a number of things that are super missing. I didn't emphasize this. I really, really, really like and have done lots of interesting things with pitch and exploring the nature of music and music theory in Melodyne when I was on Apple. And there is nothing like Melodyne available at all. I'm sorry, just give up. There's no Melodyne or anything like it or actual auto-tune that's not just a goofy little, I can do some stupid little something and tune to tempered systems. Melodyne is like a auto-tune that's much, much more creative. It allows you to go in and uh, modulate the pitch and timing of individual events in a live, in an actual recorded of audio at a 
mind-blowing level of stuff. Proprietary software, it's amazing. Um, and I really wish that we'd have something like that. That's probably the biggest pain point I have right now. And anyway, yeah, so there we are. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out. I'm going to go back to the Snowdrift.coop booth and promote free software, Mark.